Alright guys, welcome to part 5 of my terrain generation series. So I created a new, uh, new debug UI so you guys could see like what's happening here. Frame per second, draw calls, frame time, RAM that's being used and amount of chunks in the world and my position. And treads, so that's another thing. I'm gonna leave that for last. So right now there's no treads being used. So you could see we got the terrain working now so what I did for this tutorial is I changed the generation system to use a rendering server and physics server. So we're gonna go over the, how that works. So let's get to that. Okay, so here we have the chunk. This is a bit of code, so I have to leave it in. And I'll have it available on GitHub as well. So to start off, we have all the regular stuff as usual. And I name it server terrain chunk, the class name, so we could access it. So this class is gonna be um, an object instead of an actual mesh instance. We're gonna have it just instance in the scene. Well, we're not gonna have it instance in the scene. It's gonna be a reference. So here are our IDs. Our IDs are resource unique IDs. They act as the rendering servers. Um, point of reference for each object um i'm planning to make an actual tutorial on uh, rendering server and uh, physics server it's a bit out of the scope of this video to explain it all you know and i uh, have a mesh data we're gonna need this for uh for creating collisions using the physics server and uh, have an array mesh that we're also gonna use too and the material we have to give the material to the object itself this time because they're using the physics, the rendering server. So here are the rendering server references. So remember, this is one chunk, and the rendering server isn't an instance. It's just a part of the engine. So it, you access it statically, and this is just a reference to it. And same for the physics server. And you have to pass it to the scenario and the world space. So the scenario is for the rendering, where it like, kind of set in the stage for the objects that you're creating. And the space is for the physics, what world it in to interact with other objects. So I'll just put these in comments here. The reason I have these outside here, because I have to reference them from an actual node. I can't reference them from an, a script that doesn't extend anything. Okay, so here you have the regular stuff, so collision and collision visible. And we have a mutex. This is for multi-threading. We're not going to go over that right now, later on. So you have this init function. This is uh, built into all um, object scripts or scripts in general. Whenever you create an object where you say new, this is an init, for example. But you could pass in values when you override it. So now, say I'm doing this again, I would have to pass these values in. And then we set all of them here. So we set back these up here. Now, let me show you. So I have a LOD system. I change it to be on the actual generator itself. So each mesh like gets its LODs from the parent mesh that's created. Parent um, object. And generation data. I separated these from the actual generate mesh. Generate terrain. So I could call this separately to pass the noise and the grid coordinates and all that stuff. So this is for uh, the multi-threading. Because as they say, multi-threading makes code look harder to work with. And then we have, uh, let me go down, the generate terrain, so a mutex locket. And then we have the tread here I could pass. But it's started from outside the object itself. So I pass the tread so I could know when it's finished. So we lock it. Mutex lock is basically... um making sure nothing else accesses no other threads access the same data that we are working with right now so for example if i started this thread and it's running this code another thread can't run this code until it's finished so all this code is the same mostly except for right here where is it right here so right here we're using resource ids now so say instance instance the resource using the um, rendering server then we use the rendering server again and create a mesh instance it's kind of confusing enough 
it's, it's a bit advanced but i'm gonna make a tutorial on it and then we set the base we're telling this instance to be a mesh instance if that makes sense kind of like when you create a node and then well it's already a mesh instance when you create a node that most of the heavy lifting for you so we're setting the origin because i have this chunk transform here that we have to do even the position around on our own the chunk transform we have to track the position on our own and then instance set transform we're setting it to be that transform and <clears throat> we're going to add surface from arrays you get that mesh instance that's the mesh there that we created up top we tell it to be of type triangles and we pass the mesh data to it which is right there and then we go down to here we set the material to that material that we announced up top here well it's on the other class there we then we unlock the mutex this is for uh the threading as well so i had last instance set free last instance we call the third thread complete as i said we're not gonna go over that yet and then Take the thread if it's not now. Okay, wait to finish. Then we set collision. All right. So the generate collision is the same again. First, I clear the collision, whichever collision that was on it before, if there was. And create a body. Set the space. As I was telling you, need a space. And we set the mode to be a static. And we set the layer masks. These I'm not comfortable with yet, but I know this means uh, layer one. And body state, tell a state transform to be the chunk position. That's the position we're setting. So I said this code is kind of advanced, so it's, it's a lot just to set a position. Then same new mesh array. So this is where I was kind of confused. I can't actually set the, um, I can't figure out how to create the collision without doing, create a new mesh and then create tri mesh shape from that. So I set the, the shape I create the array mesh then set the shape to be the same mesh data that we had before and I say collision shape the mesh create tri mesh and then mesh shape new concave create a concave uh, polygon shape and then pass that data to the the mesh shape quick pause right here guys so I know this um what line 131 isn't actually used um kind of was just trying stuff to see what it works so ignore that line but you could see uh the new mesh it actually takes the collision shape and then it adds the collision shape to the collision body not the actual mesh shape that we're using so technically we're not using that at all then the body add shape mesh body collision body collision shape and set it identity that means it's zero zero and everything so it's local to the the collision body the shape is local to the collision then we have the regular stuff update chunk should remove i don't actually use this but it's there and then update lod's based on distance from the last tutorial so here's free chunk with free chunk we're actually removing the instance id so the object itself still remains because the object is actually a reference itself too so it gets removed on its own whenever we're not referencing it and we check if it's visible this we have to create on our own as well and then we say you get chunk visible visible and clear collisions all right that's it for one chunk but let's move on to the terrain itself most of this is the same but here i added the lod's these are what we're passing to the chunk to each chunk i mean and i've just had a category setup thing this setting categories make you have like spaces so let me show you what i mean like here i have uh terrain data it just creates that just to separate the code the editor code and then i have a debug category where i have treadings here so i have tread count and use threads so i had that off and then Let's see here I create the treads right here I mean 
Then we set the amount as usual. Then I set wireframe to be true. So I can render wireframes. Then I set it to start in the beginning. Update visible is count. That's the code we're calling every step, but we just do one to start the game. And then see what else we got going on. Mm. Let's scroll down to about here. So if say if I'm not using treads, I just generate a terrain chunk. If I am using treads, we uh check if the tread is alive. That means if the tread is currently being used. If not, it's gonna start a new tread and then break out so we don't use other treads for anything. And then come down here. So remember this is gonna be looping all the time so the threads eventually gonna not be uh is eventually gonna finish and then the loop's gonna realize that and then pass it whatever it needs again so it does work so let's go down if not we just set the data here i mean if it if this chunk doesn't exist remember from the last tutorials we set the generation data we pass the LOD system, like the values for the LODs, distance and values for each distance. So I had just five, so I need five of each. Then set LOD, and if use threads, ah, just found a mistake. All right, and then we see the threads equal threads, same as before up top. Cause this one we were updating the LODs Go over a bit. Good check up here. If terrain chunks, if terrain chunks update LOD that returns if it should update, then we reset the generation there. I don't think I need to do this, but I'll just do it just in case. So resend the generation data again. That's the same noise and everything. And then we do the check, see if it's see if we need to use threads, etc. etc. And then we check if we should remove the chunk. So we say free chunk. Remember that's free in the RID. Then we remove this chunk itself. Remember the chunk has the R is holding the RIDs, but the terrain chunk dictionary is holding the object. So this class is the object. All right. So if we exit the tree, check the treads. If treads is started, wait to finish. Active treads sticking right. All right, guys. So now if I run this code. Let's go back here. I could show you why I did it this way. So press V to see the top view. So let's turn these off. So if we come over to the editor here, you could notice that we're not generating anything in the in the map. You press the remote here to see what's going on in the game itself. So we have the player and the players up there. So let's let me show you what I mean. So before, let's open up uh, the original terrain generator. This is the first one from the beginning. Endless terrain. If we run this code, so if you look over here now, press remote. Notice that we're generating all these. And then each one that's close by the player gets a collision shape. So this is kind of a uh, taxing so since you're doing so much we improve the performance by just not putting them in the scene itself so that's why i did that uh, all right guys so that's probably the end of this tutorial so thanks for watching like and subscribe and see you in the next video